Good morning and welcome to Western Reserve United Methodist Church. Welcome all of you to our worship service this morning and any who are with us worshiping online today. For our announcements this morning, just want to remind the trustees we'll be meeting tomorrow night at 6 o'clock. Coming up this week, our men's Bible study will be on Tuesday at 8 a.m. Helping Hands and our sewing group will meet at 9 o'clock. There'll be a prayer time. The prayer group will meet at 6 o'clock on Tuesday evening, followed by a Bible study at 6.30. And at 7 o'clock, our Targo band will be rehearsing. On Wednesday, choir will be at 7 o'clock. And this Saturday will be the men's breakfast. That will be at 9 o'clock. You'll find giving statements for 2022. Um, they can be found in our narthex. I encourage you to pick those up. You'll also find copies of our church budget there for the next year. There's also a list of our church leaders for the coming year available for picking up in the narthex as well. We also are in need of some people who are willing to teach Sunday school. You can sign up to do that on the board in the narthex. There's also a sign up there if you'd be willing to provide snacks for the children. Also, please make sure you, you read the letter for, uh, in the bulletin from our finance committee chairperson, Jim Hodgson. And thank you to everyone who donated soup for the rescue mission. We collected quite a few cans of soup, for, so thank you for your generous contributions. Also, there's information about summer camp scholarship applications that can be found in our, at our Welcome Center. And also, those applications, just so you know, are due by April the 28th. Our finance committee is in need of someone to count the offering on the fourth Sunday of each month. Please let Jim Hodgson know if you'd be willing to do that. And also in our bulletin this morning, you'll find information about prayer card ministry we're going to start, upcoming Red Cross blood drive, ordering Easter flowers, information about the Shrove Tuesday pancake dinner, and also um, St. Patrick's Day drive through dinner. And just one correction, our Ash Wednesday service will be at 6.30. I had 5.30 in the bulletin. That was my mistake. It will actually be at 6.30. And Suzanne has an announcement for us this morning. I'm hoping that since I let her do the announcement, she'll take me out for lunch today. <laughs> it's a go. Yeah. yeah. I'll take it. <laughs> Today? Today? Yeah. <laughs> well, good morning. Um, seats are filling quickly for the Lancaster bus trip. Um, I know that you've seen it in the bulletin. It is going to be on June 7th and 8th. We're going to be leaving from the Western Reserve United Methodist Church in the morning, on a Wednesday morning, and coming back in the evening on Thursday night. We're going to travel to Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and go to the Sight and Sound um, Theater and see Moses. And I hear that that's going to be really awesome. Um, also, on route, we're going to stop at Flight 93 and see, and see the memorial there. We're also going to get a chance to eat um, an, uh, an authentic Amish meal in an, an Amish home. So I thought that was good. And there'll be lots of other fun things along the way. The information can be found at the welcoming center table in the narthex, and it looks kind of like this. Um, of the 50 seats really available on the bus, 36 as of this morning are full. And so if you want a seat, the way you can do that is by um, giving Deanna or, you know, sending to the office a $50 deposit. Um, that's going to hold your spot on the seat. If for whatever reason you change your mind before May the 3rd, it's fully refundable to you. Um, but it, it makes sure that there's a seat for you after May 3rd. Yeah, not my choice, but the bus bus company's decision. We really hope we can get our bus filled. This is a great opportunity for um, people from the first service and the second service and from different aspects and different groups in the church to get to know each other better. So hope to see you on the trip. Thank you. 
Just want to also let you know that if during the, the prelude you'd like to come forward to the altar rail to pray, we want to welcome you to do that. And also during the prayer time, during the pastoral prayer, if you'd like to come forward and kneel at the altar rail to pray, we want to encourage you to do that as well. So let us prepare ourselves and allow ourselves to become centered and prepared for worship as we listen to the prelude.
Come to worship <clears throat> this day. Bring with you all your joys and sorrows. Jesus, Lord, Come to worship this day, believing in the power of God through Jesus Christ. Jesus, Lord, us Come to worship this day, feeling the presence of God. join you will you join me with the unison prayer unstop our ears O oh God that we may hear your word proclaimed this day 
Open our minds and hearts to be changed. Free us from the unclean spirits of worry, fear, destruction, and guide. Teach us, Lord, that we may follow you more faithfully. Amen. Will the children please come forward at this time for our children's moments? Miss Lisa is out of town today, so she's not with us. And I found out about an hour ago I'm having children's moments this morning, so <laughs> be forgiving. That should be the lesson today's forgiveness. <laughs> no, no. Well, we had a very special birthday in our church recently. A woman by the name of Isla Cochran, and can you guess how old she was? Do you think she was older than 10? Yeah. Actually, she was 104 years old. Isn't that something? Yeah, that, yes, indeed. That's a praise God. Yes, indeed, yeah. 104, that's, that's, a, that's a lot of years, isn't it? How old are you? Nine. You're nine, okay. And how old are you? Five. You're five, yeah. So you're six, but so uh, you got you got a ways to go to hit on 104. Well, our scripture lesson today is about a woman named Sarah, and Sarah is an older woman. We like to say chronologically enhanced. It sounds better than old, but she was she was an older woman. And she found out when she was pretty old, guess what news she found out? Any guesses? She found out she was going to have a baby. Yeah, do you think that was exciting news? Well, it was because she and her husband had been waiting all their married life for a baby and had no children. Then all of a sudden when she was, I believe she was like 75, she found out, she was going to have a baby. Do you think she was pretty surprised? Ask your mom and dad when they were 75 if they'd be surprised that they found out they're going to have a baby. Yeah, she was surprised. She was really surprised. And you know what she did when she heard the news? She went, yeah, right, I'm going to have a baby now. <laughs> That's pretty funny. She laughed. But you know what happened? Within a year... Abraham and Sarah were holding a new baby. I guess we, 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 there's something we can always learn, and that's God can always do something we don't expect. God can always do something we just go, how is that possible? But with God, it is possible. And so let's, we're just going to pray today that God always keeps us open to God doing something new in our lives. I know, I know. This is called, yeah, lack of preparation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but God can always do something new. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you can always do a new thing in our lives. You're always waiting to do something new. Help us, God, to be looking for it, and to celebrate it when it comes. Amen. Hey, good to see both of you today. Oh, and, and you too. I don't know. Is it? <laughs> Would the ushers please come forward at this time for our morning presentation of our tithes and our offerings. Let us pray. 
God, we thank you for who you are. And out of your goodness, and out of your incredible love for each of us, all the good things you provide for our lives. God, the blessings you pour out upon us are too numerous for us to even begin to count, yet alone name all of them. But God, for the ways you bless us, for the opportunity you provide us to share those blessings with others that they also might be blessed, we offer our thanks and we offer our praise. Lord, bless these gifts given today that they might be used to spread the wonder of your love, of your grace, of your care to your children everywhere. For we give these gifts, we dedicate them in the name of Christ. Amen. Please be seated. The Old Testament reading is from Psalm 119, verses 1 through 8. Blessed are those whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his statutes and seek him with all their heart. They do no wrong, but follow his ways. You have laid down precepts that are to be fully obeyed. Oh, that my ways were steadfast in obeying your decrees. Then I would not be put to shame when I consider all your commands. I will praise you with an upright heart as I learn your righteous laws. I will obey your decrees. Do not utterly forsake me. For our prayer concerns this morning, we want to remember Ellen Day. That's a friend of Joanne Truax's who's having open heart surgery this Wednesday. Also, let us remember uh, Cody Weimer. That is Diane Clark's grandson. And it's good to see Tom Dorr back with us today. Tom, welcome. Good to see you. Tom's been recovering from injuries sustained in a car accident, so great to have you back with us today. Also, we want to continue to remember Linda Ward in our prayers, and Carol McLean, that is Karen Himes' cousin, who's just returned to Victoria House. And let us continue to remember those, those friends of ours, members of this congregation who are undergoing treatments for cancer, Judy Davis, John Cotton, and Linda Miller. Let us allow ourselves to become centered as we prepare to pray.
loving Christ, as we worship today, we celebrate you as the light of God that has come into the world to enter into our darkness and draw us ever closer to God. We're thankful that you are not only the light that enters the darkness of our lives, but you seek to be the light that penetrates each and every heart, each and every life, transforming the lives of people. Oh God, lead us and guide us just as you seek to lead and guide each one of your people. And God, we ask you to lead and guide the leaders of not only this nation, but of every nation. Draw those people in all lands and all places closer to you. Help them to be open to the leading and guiding presence of your spirit in their lives. God, we are thankful for the ways you use your church to be your instrument of transformation throughout the world. How you use us to share the good news of Jesus Christ with all the people that you bring into our lives. We pray for the leaders of our church, and not only the leaders of our church, but God of your churches throughout the world. Especially today, we remember our Bishop Tracy Smith Malone and our Superintendent Abby Amen. God, empower the leaders of your church in all places with your power of compassion, with your wisdom, and God, with your grace. Lord, there are those among us today with special needs in our lives. There are those who are listening today, God, who are in need of your healing presence in their lives. And God, we pray that your healing would rest upon them. Today, we especially remember Ellen and Diane, her grandson, Cody. God, we lift to you Tom and Linda and Carol. And God, we bring before you for healing Judy and John. Lord Jesus, in all your ways, let your healing come, restoring broken bodies, troubled minds, relationships that are in need of healing and restoration. For we ask these things as we do all things in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever Amen.
The Old Testament lesson, I'm sorry. Please stand if you're able. The New Testament lesson is from Mark 1, verses, <coughs> or, verses 21 through 28. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as one of the teachers of the law. Just then a man in, the, in their synagogue who was pe possessed by an impure spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, what is this, a new teaching and with authority? He even gives orders to impure spirits and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. The word of God for the people of God. Please be seated. It was during my, my junior year at Mount Union that the old science building was taken down. It had served the college for many years, but it was outdated, and uh, the condition was such that the trustees of the school thought it was best that the old building be demolished. Well, since the old Hartshorn Science Building was connected to another science building on campus, they realized that the only way to bring it down was by using a wrecking ball. Now, you can imagine the excitement this stirred on a college campus. It's not every day you see a, wreck, a wrecking ball making its way across campus. Well, I remember the day they brought the building down, a, a crowd gathered on the sidewalk as the wrecking ball was moved into place. The boom of the truck started to move gradually back and forth, causing that large weighted ball to swing. And finally, it met the building with a solid thud and nothing happened. Well, the wrecking back was pulled back, and again, it was launched into the old science building once again. And once again, nothing happened. Those of us who were gathered there kind of went, huh, this might just be the best constructed building we have on the college campus. But finally, after about the fourth or fifth blow, the old building began to crumble. The old building was brought down, and within a year, a new state-of-the-art science building took its place. Like that old science building, there are parts of our lives that need to be crumbled. Parts of who we are and what we are that we know God does not want us to hold on to. There are pieces of our personality that we continue to hang on to that are potentially harmful to ourselves and also harmful to other people. And we have this tendency to refuse to let those parts go. We hold on to them with the same resilience as that old, as that old science building on Mount Union campus. We don't let those things crumble easily. We might even try to fight off or remain oblivious to the Spirit of God that seeks to crumble those things within us. Jesus is teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum, and Mark records that the crowd there was astounded by his teaching. He taught them as one who had authority. Now, there was a man in the synagogue that day who had been possessed by an unclean spirit. He was possessed by a demon. What Mark is saying is that this man who had been created in the image of God had been taken over by an outside source. The, force, the life force that God placed within him had been hijacked. His life was under the control of a force that sought to harm him and through him bring harm to others. When Jesus, 
who had just defeated the power of Satan in the wilderness, is recognized by this unclean spirit. The spirit knows. It knows its days are numbered. And the demon cries out when it sees Jesus. What have you to do with me, Jesus? Have you come to destroy us? Through his words and through his actions, Jesus demonstrates that indeed, he has come to destroy that which is not of God, that which has taken over what ultimately belongs to God. Jesus has been given the authority and the power to do away with the ungodly and the ungodlike parts that are within God's people. It's rather interesting that most in the people in the synagogue simply view Jesus as a teacher with great authority. And they are amazed at how the unclean spirit obeys him. But these spectators fail to see who Jesus really is. It's only the unclean spirit that recognizes Jesus' true identity. In the narrative, it's only the unclean spirit that affirms what we have learned to be true of Jesus at his baptism that he is the Holy One of God, that the Spirit of God has come to dwell in him, that he is the Anointed One who has come to reclaim who and what ultimately belongs to God. Yet it's only this unclean spirit that realizes Jesus' mission is to destroy the ungodly that has, that has hijacked that which is godly. You have to wonder as you look at this text, why is it only the unclean spirit that recognizes who Jesus is? Why don't the other people in the synagogue understand his true identity? We have to wonder why the good religious folks at Capernaum only see Jesus as a teacher who has the authority to cast out demons and fail to see him as anything more than that. But this unclean spirit, this enemy of God, realizes who he's up against. The demon realizes he's up against the Son of God. You know, I think this failure to see has something to do with our nature. There's something about us. It's only when we are completely broken that we are most open to being changed. Well, there may be parts of our lives that we feel are not exactly how God wants them to be. We think that as long as we keep them in check, as long as we don't allow them to dominate who we are, we find that we're willing to put up with them. And, and, and by doing so, keep God at bay. We think we can handle it, and we deny how serious the problem really is. There's also that part of us that doesn't want to, to risk the embarrassment of, of making others aware of something that we're struggling with. It. We want to maintain the perception that we have it all together. We want to maintain the illusion that we can manage our lives on our own. Then there's that other piece of the equation. Pleasure is often associated with those parts of our lives that are most estranged from God. <coughs> it, it could be the pleasure from, from a sexual fantasy or, or the pleasure that derives from, from thinking about something that we covet or the pleasure that arrives when we, when we think about the acquisition of great wealth or coming into a position of great power. We also have this tendency to speak about our faith in very intellectual ways. We, we, can, we can easily say that we need Christ in our lives, but when it really comes down to letting Jesus into those areas of our lives that we need him to most enter into, we, like that unclean spirit, have a tendency to say, what have you, do, what have you to do with me, Jesus? Leave me alone. Leave me alone. The religious folks at Capernaum 
held Jesus at bay by reducing Jesus to nothing more than a rabbi with authority. They view him as a powerful guy who has the ability to cast out demons, but they don't begin to consider what he can really do for their lives. They fail to consider that if Jesus can transform the life of this man who was possessed by, by a demon, what can he possibly do for their lives? Many years ago, I had the occasion to view an interview that Larry King had with the Reverend Ted Haggard. You may remember Reverend Haggard. He was at one time a very prominent evangelical leader who had founded the New Life Church in Colorado Springs. He was also the president of the National Association of Evangelicals. At the time I saw the interview, he'd come into some difficult times. A couple of years earlier, a male prostitute had come forward and said that he had met with Haggard on numerous occasions. After initially denying those allegations, Haggard finally admitted that indeed some of what this person said was true. In a letter to the congregation of the New Life Church, Haggard wrote, and listen to how he phrased this, there is a part of my life that is so repulsive and dark that I have been warring against it throughout my adult life. Did you hear that? There's a part of my life I have been warring against throughout my entire adult life. Haggard was aware of this destructive peace within him. In his life, he knew Jesus could transform that part of his life. He knew that Jesus had the authority and the power to destroy it. But I sensed that he, just like the religious folks in Capernaum, wouldn't let Jesus close to that piece of him for reasons we will never completely understand. I often wondered what would have happened if before anything had, had happened in Haggard's life, if he had had a close group of friends he could have met with and just said to them, I don't know why, but I'm really struggling with something in my life right now. There is a dark peace within me that needs to be transformed. I am really being drawn to express this dark part of myself, and I need your help to resist that temptation. As a part of a fellowship of, of, of fellow Christians, help me so that I don't do what I'm going to regret and help me to find Christ's healing and Christ's restoring power for my life. The very nature of life is that we who have been created in God's image have had parts of our lives that have been hijacked by that which is not God. There are parts of who we are that are more invested in our own destruction and in the destruction of others than with promoting God's purpose of spiritual health, peace, and wholeness within our lives. Do you ever feel like there's a part of who you are that doesn't really reflect what God intends your life to be? Are there parts of who you are that you know God did not create and put there, yet they're present within you? When I look at myself, and I mean really take a deep look at the person I am, you know, each week I, I do about a few days where I take some time and spend them in self-examination and call God to reveal in me parts of who I am that are, being dis that are destructive to me and have the potential of being destructive to other people. To be aware of those parts within me that are crying out, what have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of God? Have you come to destroy me? And I have to closely listen to Jesus when he says, yes, Yes, I have come to destroy parts of who you are. I have come to destroy parts of you who you are so that those parts can be remade in God's image for you. 
the parts of our lives that are in need of, of Christ's restoring power are going to be different for each one of us. Some people, it's going to be a desire for power within them. Fantasies of power that have a tendency to take them over. For others, it's a desire and a fantasy about great wealth. For others, it's, it's about deep-seated issues of anger that have a way that they're concerned are going to leak out and bring damage to the relationships in their lives. For others, it's a concern about lust and, letting, and possibly losing control of that lust that they have going on in their lives. Those wounded parts of our lives, those ungodly parts are going to be different for each one of us. But when we recognize those parts within ourselves, instead of keeping them at arm's length, instead of keeping Christ at arm's length, we can invite him to come in and to cast out those ungodly parts that are trying to take us over. To make room for Christ to do Christ's life-transforming work within us. This is not something that we can easily do on our own. It's best done in the community of believers. Sometimes even believers that have similar issues to the ones we're struggling with. I have a friend of mine whose family has had financial struggles for many years. And if you talk to him about what he fantasized about in his life, it was financial independence. It was about being financially sound. He dreamed about winning it big at a casino. <laughs> he, he, he dreamed big about making that, that investment in a, in a high-risk item, but it, it, it pays off. He has these dreams ultimately of financial security. And he could have use some slower means to try to build wealth, to try to build a sense of financial security for his family. But he didn't want that. He thought he could get rich quick and take care of all their financial struggles. Yet when you talk to him, he realized there was a part of him that realized that this was really pretty crazy thinking. But there was a part of him also that believed it was ultimately possible there was a part of him that knew it was not acceptable to keep this as a secret from the members of his family. Because neither his wife nor any other family members knew about this. He had convinced himself that what he was going to do was acceptable to do. After all, he said it was his paycheck. What he was going to do was only going to be beneficial to his wife and to his children. The money wasn't going to be missed by his family because it would only be out of his checking account for a short time until he hit it big and all their financial concerns would be gone. So he gambled online. He also made some questionable high-risk investments, and they both failed. He came to me to talk to me about the issue, and after praying together, I encouraged him to get involved with Gamblers Anonymous. And he did this for a short time. I imagine if he would have stuck with it, it could have really helped him. He could have been aware of that broken piece within him that was driving him, that was really behind this financial concern that he had. It could have helped to restore him as Christ offers to do. While he knew what he was doing was harming his relationship with his wife, he struggled to let that broken piece of his life experience the life-transforming power of Jesus Christ. And even when he was part of a community of faith and a community of those of Gamblers Anonymous who would have helped him, he refused to let that broken piece within him to experience the life-transforming presence of God. In our brokenness, we look at Jesus and we say, What have you to do with me, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? And he answers us by saying, Yes. I've come to destroy those broken pieces within your life. I have come to take them away and in their place leave the image of the Creator the creator who wants to restore you. 
And that's what he offers to us today. He offers us God's desire, God's help. The help of the Christian community to destroy those parts of us that need to be taken away. And to make space for God to to remake us and to remold us into the image of God for our lives. Let us pray. Oh, Jesus, when we cry out, what have you to do with us? Let us know what you have to do with us. You're there to heal us in the midst of our brokenness and our incompleteness. You're there to to transform us, to make us into a new creation. A new creation that's centered in things that are healthy, that that is centered in things that are life-giving, that is centered in things that are life-transforming. Oh God, make us, mold us in your image for our lives. For we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.
God who leads us. As you have led us in the past, God, we trust you to lead us into the future. Lead us, guide us to be aware of those parts within ourselves that need to be healed and transformed. And lead us to be your agents of healing and of transformation in the world. For we go forth in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. I play this. 